Let's work a few example problems related to the common emitter configuration. In the first problem, we're going to estimate the AC gain. We can learn a lot just by inspection. First of all, we don't have much of an input voltage divider here. At the output side, we do have a bit of a voltage divider. That's going to drop my gain by a factor of two or so. But because we have a gain of about two, I'm predicting that my overall gain from this circuit is going to be roughly one. Negative one, that is, because it's a common emitter configuration. Let's work it in detail, though, and see how close our estimate was. First of all, I want to make sure that this transistor is properly biased in the forward active mode. I can't go through and calculate the gain unless we're sure that it's forward active. If it's saturated or if it's cut off, then it's not going to work. My base voltage is some fraction of 10 volts given by the voltage divider set up by these two resistors. It works out to 4 volts. My emitter voltage ought to be about 0.7 volts below it. 3.3 volts. For DC, all of the current goes through the left resistor. Everything's blocked from the right by that 10 nanofarad capacitor. Therefore, my DC emitter current is just 3.3 divided by 1 kilo ohms, or 3.3 milliamps. I can now find my collector voltage. It's going to be 10 minus my collector current, which I'm estimating to be roughly my emitter current, times 1.2 kilo ohms. That works out to be about 6 volts. It's in the forward active mode if my collector voltage is higher than my base voltage, which is higher than my emitter voltage. These voltages nicely progress from high to low, so I can say, yes, my transistor is indeed biased in the forward active mode. Now we can move on to the gain calculation. Let's draw an equivalent circuit model for the small signal. It's definitely small because it's only one millivolt peak to peak. I can also see that my frequency is a radio frequency here, one megahertz. I see that these capacitors are fairly large, so I'm guessing it's not going to be a problem here with filtering. We're going to have some input impedance looking into that amplifier. I'll label it R sub n. We're going to have some voltage gain. I'm going to label it A for the moment. I'll label the output impedance R sub out. And then finally, we have our load. What's R sub n? Well, we've got the 12 kilo ohm resistor going up to an AC ground. We have the 8 kilo ohm resistor going down to a ground. I could probably stop right there, but I'll go ahead and use impedance reflection to get this branch going into the base of the transistor. We know that we've got a little emitter resistance R sub E, but that's typically only a few ohms, so it's not going to matter when I compare it to these larger resistors that are in series with it. I'm just going to forget about it here. The only thing that's left are these two resistors, the one kilo ohm and one kilo ohm resistors. If I plug in beta equals 100 as a good estimate, then I come up with 4.38 kilo ohms for my input impedance. The voltage gain here should be the resistance connected to my collector divided by the resistances connected to my emitter. There's a negative sign here because it's a common emitter configuration, and that's inverting. Down here in the denominator, we just have 1K in parallel with 1K. This works out to negative 2.4. Our output impedance here is just 1.2 kilo ohms. We have everything we need in order to calculate the gain. We first have our input voltage divider. Then we have our gain segment. And then we have our output voltage divider. When we plug in all of the numbers, we find that the gain is approximately minus 1.07. I said earlier that by inspection, I expected it to be roughly negative 1. It was accurate here. 
Let's try another example. As before, let's start off by verifying that the transistor is properly biased in the forward active mode. My base voltage should be halfway down from 9 volts. It's an even voltage divider through those two 10 kilo ohm resistors. My emitter voltage is just 0 0.7 volts below that. My DC emitter current all goes through that 1 kilo ohm resistor. 3.8 divided by 1 kilo ohm is just 3.8 milliamps. I can then find my DC collector voltage. It works out to be 5.2 volts. The collector is higher than the base, and the base is higher than the emitter. The transistor is in the forward active mode. Because the emitter here is given an AC short through this large 10 microfarad capacitor, I'm going to need to know what little R sub E is here. It's estimated by taking 26 divided by my emitter current, expressed in milliamps. Here, that's 6.8 ohms. My emitter resistance looking in is 10 kilo ohms in parallel with 10 kilo ohms. In parallel with my emitter resistance reflected over to my base. That's a pretty small number relative to 10 kilo ohms. So in this problem, using impedance reflection really makes a difference. My output impedance here is just one kilo ohm, as I typically ignore the large output impedance looking down into the collector of a bipolar transistor. Let's draw the small signal equivalent circuit. Here's the input side. We have 100 ohms. We then have our input impedance, 599 ohms. Here's our gain segment. Our gain here is just what's connected to the collector divided by what's connected to the emitter. We then have our output segment and our load. The overall gain of the circuit is given by our input segment times our AC gain times the voltage divider at the output segment. It works out to minus 63 here. That's a pretty big gain, but one thing to keep in mind is that when you shunt the emitter resistor in order to raise up the gain so high like that, you wind up making the gain a little bit unpredictable. This emitter resistance, for example, depends on the temperature because 26 here is just Kt, where T is measured in Kelvin. So if you heat it up a little bit, then the emitter resistance is going to go up and then your gain is going to go down. So the gain becomes slightly uncontrollable. It's just something to keep in mind if you decide to use this technique in circuits. Let's now design an amplifier. We're going to design an amplifier which provides approximately 2 millivolt peak-to-peak cross-a-load. Since we're starting here with a source that provides 1 millivolt peak-to-peak, -peak, what we're looking for here is an amplifier with an overall gain of 2. Let's start off by providing an appropriate DC bias point. I like to use 10 kilo ohm resistors because it makes the math easy. With a power supply at 10 volts, that's going to create 5 volts DC here at the base, 4.3 volts here at the emitter. And if I use a 1 kilo ohm resistor here, then we're going to have 4.3 milliamps of emitter current. If I put a 1 kilo ohm resistor up here as well, then my voltage at the collector is going to be 10 minus 4.3 times 1, or 5.7. That will properly bias the transistor in the forward active mode, because 5.7 is greater than 5, which is greater than 4.3. Now, if I have 2 millivolts across the load, 
Am I in danger of saturating the transistor? Well, if we add one millivolt to 5.7 volts, then the voltage is just going to rise by 5.701 volts. I'm not going to deviate very far from my DC bias point. There's no danger, for example, that this voltage is going to get too low such that it would saturate the transistor. 5.699, for example, is greater than 5.0005, isn't it? Let's draw a small signal equivalent circuit here. One thing to take note of here is that our source isn't very good. It has a pretty big source impedance, doesn't it? Our input impedance is 10 kilo ohms in parallel with 10 kilo ohms, and then we're going to have something coming up from impedance reflection. Let me label this RE1. I now have an expression for my reflected impedance. Now my gain segment is going to be my resistor at the collector divided by my resistors at the emitter. Finally, I have an output segment. Since I've already chosen this to be one kilo ohm, I know what my output impedance is going to be. When calculating my overall gain, I'm going to take note of the fact that my input voltage divider might not be too serious. Let's just estimate it firstly as one. We then have our gain segment, which is minus 1K over 1K in parallel with RE1. And then our output segment, well, 900 is really close to one kilo ohm, so I'm going to estimate this as one half, and we need our overall gain to be approximately two. So I can estimate my RE1 by requiring this to be around four. This gives me a first estimate of RE1 as being about 333 ohms. If I take 333 ohms and I plug it into here, and I estimate beta as being around 100, then I can come up with an expression for my net input impedance. It works out to be around 4,100. Let's now refine my expression for the overall gain. I'm going to make RE1 a variable again. And instead of using 1 half, I'm going to use a more proper expression here at the output side. We need that to equal 2, so I can now find a better value or a better estimate for my necessary RE1. If I solve this expression for RE1, given that it's the only variable left, I wind up with 235 ohms. I could iterate a few times in order to find a good estimate for RE1, but I'm going to stop right here. The actual gain winds up being 1.9. It turns out that if you choose an RE1 of 220 ohms, then it works out to exactly two. But these are just estimates. And normally when you're designing an amplifier, you should always over-design in the first place. You should make the gain a little bit more than what you would ever need in the circuit. I'm now going to choose my capacitor values. I'm going to take note here that it's a one megahertz signal. That's in the radio range. So if I choose capacitors that are in the nanofarad range, then usually these are safe choices. I'm going to pick one nanofarad here, 10 nanofarads here, because 900 is smaller than my input impedance on this side. And then I'm also going to pick 10 nanofarads down here. My smallest R is down here. You see, this is 235 ohms, but my load here is 900 ohms. If I check the corner frequency of this branch, then as long as it's safe, then the 10 nanofarad choice will also be safe here. If we plug in my choice for RE1, I find that the corner frequency is about 67.7 
kilohertz. That's quite a bit below my working frequency of a megahertz, so we're fine. The corner frequency up here would be even lower, no problem. This amplifier was relatively easy to design because the necessary gain was moderate. Let's now work an example where we need a little bit more gain. In this example, we again have a source at one millivolt peak to peak, and we're asked to design an amplifier which gives us 10 millivolts across the load. That means that our required gain is going to be negative 10. I'm again going to choose my resistors here at the collector and the emitter to be one kilo ohm. It's a reasonable choice because one kilo ohm is not very large relative to my load resistor. In fact, we want these resistors to be small, but we don't want them to be too small. If we make these resistors too small, then it causes the emitter current to become larger and larger, which then causes the base current to become larger and larger. If the base current is non-negligible, then it could cause our estimation of the base voltage to be incorrect. A good ratio of resistors on the left side of the transistor to resistors on the right side of the transistor is about 10. Therefore, I'm going to choose 10 kilo ohms here on the left. That's going to cause the base voltage to be 5 volts. That will then cause the DC emitter voltage to be 4.3 volts. The emitter current is then going to be 4.3 milliamps. The collector voltage is then going to be 10 minus 1 kilo ohm times 4.3 milliamps. We have 5.7 volts. My transistor is properly biased in the forward active region provided that my base current is negligible. The factor of 10 is going to ensure that it is negligible. Let's calculate my emitter resistance. We might need that if my resistor RE1 winds up being too small. RE is just 26 divided by my emitter current, expressed in milliamps. Here it's about 6 ohms. Let's now draw a small signal circuit for the whole amplifier. Now we have 10 kilo ohms in parallel with 10 kilo ohms, so that's going to be 5 kilo ohms, and then we've got one more branch going into the base. We'll use impedance reflection in order to find it. It's going to be beta times Re plus this branch in parallel with this branch. We then have our gain, which is going to be 1 kilo ohm divided by these two resistors in parallel. I could add little RE to it down here too, but I'm going to skip it for now, otherwise the equations are going to get really complicated. Let's continue with our output side here. Let's now write a full expression for our gain. We have a voltage divider here at the input side. Now we have our gain segment, and then we have our output voltage divider. All that needs to equal negative 10, and the only variable in there is RE1. If you solve it like this, it works out that RE1 should be about 25 ohms, but this design is not very satisfying. If beta drops to 75, for example, then the gain drops to 9.5. So the gain is not really very stable. If you heat it up by 100 degrees, then RE changes, and the gain also changes by a similar amount. Nonetheless, we can still squeeze a gain of 10 out of a single transistor. If our emitter resistor RE1 goes all the way to zero though, the gain here is still only 27. So it's going to be hard, for example, if we want a gain of like 50 or 100 out of a single transistor, given our restrictions that are brought about by the source impedance and the load impedance. Let's now choose our capacitors. I'm going to pick one nanofarad here 
10 nonal farads here at the output, just like in the previous problem, but I'm going to bump it up to 100 nanofarads farads down here. The reason is that our emitter resistor here is about a factor of 10 lower than it was in the last example. So let me raise up that emitter bypass capacitor to compensate for it. Now in this example, we're supposed to design an amplifier that gives us 50 millivolts across a 900 ohm load. So the load is the same as it was in the previous examples. Our source impedance at one kilo ohm is also the same as in the previous examples. We're going to have a problem, however, designing an amplifier that gives us this high of a gain. We're going to have to use a two-stage amplifier. This is going to be my strategy here. I'm going to start off with a common collector amplifier. That will give me a high input impedance and a small output impedance. That will be perfect for driving a common emitter amplifier, which can give me high gain. Let's go ahead and draw it out. We're going to start with the source and the source impedance, which were given in the problem. We're then going to require an input coupling capacitor followed by our common collector stage. For a common collector amplifier, I won't require any resistor attached to the collector. It's common or attached to ground. This should provide a good buffer. We'll need a coupling capacitor so we can properly bias the common emitter amplifier at the next stage. After the common emitter stage, we'll then have a coupling capacitor, followed by our load. Let's choose 10 nanofarad capacitors for the coupling ones. Let's choose one microfarad for the emitter bypass capacitor, though. From the previous problems, I'm reasonably sure they're going to be just fine. Now, the whole point of having a common collector amplifier here attached to the input is to give it a high input impedance. So let's make sure that we actually have a high input impedance. I'm gonna put big resistors here. Let's use 100 kilo ohms. Remember though that we need about a factor of 10 difference from the right and the left side of these transistor circuits. So that's going to mean that we need about 10 kilo ohms here on the right. That's fine because the output impedance of a common collector amplifier is typically low enough to ignore. In other words, I've just created a buffer so that my R in is high enough to neglect and my R out is low enough to neglect. Let's now choose a common emitter configuration similar to what we did in the previous example. 10 kilo ohms on the left and 1 kilo ohms on the right. Let's label this RE1, and that's what we're going to have to find here. We're going to have an input divider here created by the one kilo ohm resistor and the 50 kilo ohm resistors here, but it's going to be so close to one that I'm going to neglect it. That means that my overall gain is going to be given by the gain of the common emitter amplifier and the output impedance. The gain of the common emitter amplifier is given by this resistance divided by these two in parallel. The output voltage divider is just our load resistor divided by our load resistor plus the output impedance. We want this to be minus 50. If we solve this for RE1, then the solution is that RE1 should be approximately 9 ohms. The problem with this calculation is that RE1 ended up being kind of small, similar in fact to our little RE, or the emitter resistance of all these transistors. So we're going to have a bit of a problem. The gain is probably not going to be quite as high as what we expected. We better include this RE in our calculation of the gain, shouldn't we? We can estimate this as being about 6 ohms if we work through the DC problem. A refined expression for the overall gain would have to include this. Let's go ahead and rewrite our expression for the gain and again solve for RE1. 
We just calculated that the emitter resistor RE1 should be about 3 ohms. That would solve all of the constraints of the problem itself and give us the required gain, but it's not very satisfying, is it? The gain is going to depend on the temperature, and it seems very close to little r sub e, so the gain may not be even very accurate. I went ahead and simulated this circuit, and I found out that the gain is going to be around 45 with everything that I chose. If we drop RE1 to 2 ohms, then it gives a gain of 50. But again, it's not very satisfying, is it? If the gain of the entire circuit changes from the design value when you change a one resistor by a single ohm, not very good, right? How can we do even better? I want to remind you now of how we can use op amps to make amplifiers. I'm going to show one op amp configuration in particular. You might recall that the gain for this particular circuit, if we have a good amplifier, is just minus R2 over R1. The gain is really controllable. You can control it by these resistors. But what are some of the properties of the op amp itself? This is an inverting amplifier. It has a high input impedance. It has a small output impedance. And the absolute value of the gain is high and unpredictable. Does that remind you of any circuit that we've just worked on? In the last example, we also had a high but unpredictable gain in an inverting amplifier. You see, what's inside the dotted lines here doesn't have to be an op amp. It can be any amplifier, provided it has reasonably good properties. This technique of wrapping resistors from input to output is called negative feedback, and it provides a way to stabilize the gain of any kind of amplifier that has high but unpredictable gain. Effectively, it lowers the effective gain. It sacrifices some of the gain, in other words, in order to improve stability. You can use that for all these transistor circuits as well. For example, I could replace the op amp with a three-stage amplifier using transistors. I could have a common collector stage. That'll give me a good high input impedance. I could follow it by a common emitter stage. I could completely shunt the emitter resistor to give it as high a gain as possible. I could then follow it up with another common collector stage in order to provide a nice low output impedance. These three transistor stages together would probably meet all of the conditions that I've set out to meet. They provide an op amp replacement, so to speak. You could then wrap resistors R1 and R2 around these circuits in order to control the gain. That's using a technique of negative feedback, and I've just introduced it to you. Hopefully now you've understood how it's possible to design any kind of gain from transistor circuits.